Our reading today is taken from Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 9. This is the word of the Lord, which says, This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And we'll end it there at verse 13. Amen. In this time of lockdown, as we watch the news footage and see the graphs grow exponentially, as we see the death toll rise, as we hear stories of our friends and our loved ones, even people in our own church families suffering the effects of the coronavirus, many people are turning to God and they are praying. I've seen so many people who wouldn't go near a church or even call themselves Christians appealing for prayer or even praying themselves. But what do we pray for at a time like this? And how do we pray at a time like this? Well, for the next few weeks, we're going to look at the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray in order to help us in this time as we pray for the situation around the world. We're going to look at what we call the Lord's prayer and see how this can help us at this time, especially at this time of crisis. We have an instruction here coming from the mouth of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, telling us how we should speak to God the Father. We have God himself teaching us how we should speak to God. And so if anything can affect our relationship with God, it is this prayer. If anything can direct us on how we pray and what we pray, it's this prayer. So we're going to look at it as we find it in Luke 11, but we're going to also go back to Matthew as well because put the two of them together and we get the Lord's Prayer. So Luke starts off in verse 1. It says this, Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. Which is an interesting request. You'd almost think the disciples didn't get who Jesus was. Because they're asking Jesus, the Son of God, to teach them how to pray like someone else did. It's like they're saying, hey Jesus, I know you're the Son of God and all that. But here, would you teach us how to pray like John taught his disciples? Kind of sounds strange if we think of it like that. But that's not how we look at this verse. Actually, what's going on here is that different groups of Jews had their own prayers to show corporate identity. It's kind of like a national anthem for discipleship groups. And so John's disciples would have prayed a certain prayer in a certain way, and it would have shown everyone that they are John's disciples. And so if people were hearing John's disciples pray, they would know that they're John's disciples by the way they prayed and by what they prayed. And so Jesus' disciples are asking Jesus, here, Teach us a prayer that will show everyone that we are your disciples. So actually this prayer, what we call the Lord's Prayer, should actually be called the Disciples' Prayer. Because it represents how followers of Jesus are to approach God. But prayer wasn't a new thing to the Jews. The Jews had set times to pray where they would go to the temple to pray at the ninth hour or the twelfth hour and so on and so on. And what they prayed regularly was called the Shema. And it's a Hebrew word that means hear. And it comes from Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 5, where it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Now, this was a, was a sacred rhythm for the Jews. It was what they did at regular intervals in the day to remind them of who they were and whose they were. It reminded them of their identity. And so at regular intervals in the day, they would stop and focus on God and pray the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And they'd be reminded, oh yes, the Lord is our God, and he is one, and I have to love him with everything I've got Kind of in case they forget. And then three hours later they do it again. Hear O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Oh yeah, I, the Lord is one and I have to love him with everything I've got. 
So the Shema was kind of like a sacred rhythm. It reminded them of their identity. It reminded them that they are the Lord's people and their function as the Lord's people, their purpose in life was to love God with everything they've got. And so Jesus is doing the same thing here with his disciples in the Lord's Prayer. He's saying to them, here's a sacred rhythm that you can use which will give you your identity as one of Jesus' followers. And so Jesus is giving his disciples a way of reminding them who they are and whose they are. Who who do I belong to? Who am I? Oh yeah, that's right. I'm a child of God. I belong to Jesus. And so this is a sacred rhythm that we too, as disciples of Jesus, as followers of Jesus, we can learn this prayer and pray it and remember who we are and whose we are. We can use this prayer to remember our identity in Christ. This is Jesus giving his disciples a sense of their identity, of how they find themselves in God. And so as we enter into the Lord's Prayer as a sacred rhythm, we can be reminded every time we pray it, just where we belong in the grand scheme of things. And the first word in this prayer is so important. The first word is Father. And this is where this is so important because this is where we as followers of Jesus find our identity. The first word of the Lord's Prayer is critical in how we see ourselves. The first words are crucial in how we find our identity in Christ. And like I said, the first word is Father. Or as it is in Matthew, our Father. Now this has huge implications to the disciples. I mean, huge implications. See, in the Old Testament, God is referred to as Father on a few occasions. For example, Deuteronomy 1, 30 to 31 says this, The Lord your God, who is going before you, will fight for you as he did for you in Egypt, before your very eyes, and in the wilderness. There you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a father carries his son, all the way you went until you reached this place. So this is imagery here of God where he is portrayed like a father who would carry his son. In a similar way in Hosea 11.1 we have, When Israel was a child I loved him and out of Egypt I called my son. And so we have instances like this in the Old Testament where God is portrayed as a father to his people the Israelites. However this is done in the form of a metaphor or a simile. They are ways to describe what God is like not what God actually is. See, in the Old Testament, God is like a father in the way he cares for his people. He is a good father. He takes care of his people. He provides for his people. In the Old Testament, God is like a father, but he is never addressed as father. You've got to see the difference there. He's referred to like a father. There are descriptions of him being like a father, but no one ever, ever, ever in the Old Testament addresses God as father. You are my father. And even in the New Testament, Jesus calls God the father, but it's something that he uses of his own father because he's the son of God. But here in the Lord's Prayer, both in Matthew and Luke, Jesus, for the first time ever, gives the disciples the right to address God as their father. So this is the first time ever throughout the biblical narrative that normal human beings are given the right to call God father. This is big stuff. Remember last week when we were talking about Jesus' resurrection and through our faith in him, we get new birth, we get born again. And his resurrection was the start of this new creation And we're part of that new creation. And John says, to those who believed in him, to those who received him, he gave them the right to be called children of God, born not of natural descent, but born of God. And because of that, we have the right, the right to call God our father. This is huge. It's not like we're calling God like a father. We are calling him our father. See, never ever before has God been addressed as Father because it's too familiar. It's language that is too intimate. God in the Old Testament is seen as a powerful, holy, awesome God, and he still is. But here's Jesus saying, if you follow me, this powerful, holy, awesome God 
becomes your dad. Not like a dad, he is your dad. And this flies in the face of both the Roman and Jewish cultures. You see, Jewish prayer started with God of Abraham or God of Jacob or something like that. But Jesus chooses our Father. Jesus is introducing the disciples to a family of faith that goes beyond Abraham. This is your new birth, guys. And in Roman culture, Caesar, who is considered the Lord of the nation, people worship him as a god, Caesar is to be addressed as follows. Now, bear with me here. This is how Caesar is to be addressed. The emperor Caesar, Galerius, Valerius, Maximanus, Invictus, Augustus, Pontifex, Maximus, Germanicus Maximus, Egypticus Maximus, Phoebicus Maximus, Saramenticus Maximus, Saramenticus Maximus, Saramenticus Maximus, Saramenticus Maximus, Saramenticus Maximus, Perseus Maximus, Perseus Maximus, Capricus Maximus, Capricus Maximus, Capricus Maximus, Capricus Maximus, Capricus Maximus, Capricus Maximus, Arminicus Maximus, Medicus Maximus, Abendicus Maximus, holder of the tribunal authority for the 20th time, emperor for the 19th council for the 8th Pater Patri Pro Council. And that's how Caesar is to be addressed. And here is Jesus talking about the creator almighty God who is much bigger than any king or kingdom or any Caesar. Jesus says, call him dad. Jesus breaks down all the barriers that the religious system had put up. He tears them all down. All the hoops that people had to jump through, Jesus tears them all down and he gives us direct access to the Father, our Father in heaven. Now, how does he do that? Well, Paul says in Romans 8 that those who have put their trust in Jesus Christ are adopted into God's family, adopted with full inheritance rights, all because Jesus made it possible. Romans 8, 15, Paul writes, The spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought you out or brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. See, what Jesus did on the cross and when he rose again changed our relationship with God forever. Through his spirit, he gave us direct access to God the Father. But not only that, through his spirit, he gives us adoption. Adoption into God's family. That's how we can call him Father. But it's only if we have put our full faith and trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour. Because when we do that, we become adopted into God's family. And that's why we can call him Dad. That's why we can call him Father. See, if you haven't trusted in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, if you're not a follower of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus, then you can't call God your father because you're not adopted into his family. And therefore, if you can't call God your father, you can't pray this prayer. For example, I can't call Boris Johnson my father unless he has adopted me into his family. And none of us can call God father unless we've been adopted into God's family. And that adoption comes through our faith in Jesus Christ. Don't forget, this prayer is the disciples' prayer. It can only be prayed by Jesus' disciples. This prayer is only to be prayed by people who are in God's family because if you're not in God's family, you can't call him Father. And so if you're not in God's family, you can't pray this prayer because this prayer starts, Our Father. See, it's only to be prayed by people who are in God's family who have the right to call him Dad. But if you are a disciple of Jesus, if you are following Jesus Christ, God has given you access into his family. He has stamped the adoption certificate and we can call God our father because we have been given the right to call God our father. This is a tremendous privilege for those who are Christians because you and you alone are the only ones who have the right to call God father. Now, isn't that awesome? For example, anyone in the world can call me Andre. Anyone in the world can call me doctor or reverend or reverend doctor because that's my title. You all have a right to call me reverend doctor. And anyone in the world can call me father if they want to. 
but there are only two people in the whole entire world who have the right to call me dad. And it's my two daughters. Nobody else in the world has the right to call me dad. But followers of Jesus are the only people in the entire world who have the right to call God their father. Because they are adopted into his family through their faith in Jesus Christ. And what an awesome privilege that is. I mean, sit there for a second and take that in. God Almighty, the creator of the universe, is now your father. And for some people, that's an amazing image. Because they know of a father or a father figure who has taken care of them, who has provided for them, who they respect. And so the image of father is a good image. It fills them with warmth and comfort and a sense of protection. The problem is for other people, the image of father is nothing but fear and maybe even hatred. Because all they've known from a father or a father figure has been pain and abuse and suffering. And when they hear of God as a father, they want nothing to do with that. Because that image is loaded with pain. Remember this, earthly fathers are human. With all the faults and feelings and sinfulness uh, and sinfulness that every father has. But that's not the case with God. He is a heavenly father. God is a perfect father who loves more than any father loves. Who protects more than any father protects. Who cares more than any father cares. Who provides more than any father can provide. You see, God is not like any human father. And so we can't compare God to anyone here on earth because that just doesn't come close. God is a perfect father. He will not abuse your love. He will not abuse your trust like some fathers do. He's a perfect father who loves his children more than they can fathom. And even when we turn our back on him and do our own thing, while it breaks his heart, if we return to him and repent and run to him, he runs to us with arms open wide. He will throw his arms around us and kiss us like the good father in the story of the prodigal son. That's what a perfect father does. And so as followers of Jesus, that's who we have as our dad. That's where our identity is. That's where our place in this world is. That's why we can pray the Lord's Prayer and pray with boldness, our Father. What a picture of love and care we have in our Father. And it's all made possible by Jesus Christ. A picture of love and care doesn't even come close to what God is really like. But thanks to Jesus, thanks to his death and resurrection, when we put our faith in him, we get adopted into his family. So when we put all this together, we see that the Jews had their sacred rhythm where they prayed the Shema to remember who they were and whose they were when they stopped and remembered, oh yeah, I'm one of God's people. The Lord is our God. And I've got to love him with everything I've got. And this is something we can do with this prayer. Because it helps to put everything in perspective. And so throughout the day this week, try it for a week. Every one of you who has the right to call God their father. Let's pray this prayer as a sacred rhythm. To remember just who you are and whose you are. So, for example, all you frontline workers who are working desperately to keep us safe at home, before you go out to work, during work, stop and pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven. And then remember, oh yeah, that's who I am. I'm a child of God. And so in the grand scheme of things, my work, while important, doesn't define me. Because I'm a child of God, loved by God the Father, protected by God the Father. Or for those who are in the house and dealing with screaming children maybe, and you're pulling your hair out, stop and pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, oh yeah, that's right, I'm a child of God, and my frustration now does not define me, because I'm a child of God, and I'm not a bad parent for feeling this way. I'm just a human, sinful person, but I have a good, good father who still loves me. And when you feel low or depressed or so isolated that you can't go on anymore or you feel like you can't go on anymore, 
like you simply can't take it anymore, stop and pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven. Oh yeah, that's right. Because I've given my life to Jesus, I have a right to call you Father. I have a right to call you Dad. And I know you care for me. And I know you love me. And I know you provide for me because that's what a perfect father does and I am your child. And if you're fighting this virus physically, stop and pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven. Oh yeah, that's right. I'm a child of God. I am a new creation and this virus can't touch this new creation. And I have God as my dad who loves me like a perfect father loves his child. Who takes care of me like a perfect father takes care of their child. Who will stay by my side like a perfect father will stay by a child's side. This prayer gives us our identity. And our identity is that we are children of God. And that is what we are if we are followers of Jesus Christ. Let's pray this prayer together now. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.